So let's uh, start with it. So first, who am I? I'm a Portuguese. Um, first time I coded, I think it was in the late 80s, uh, in a ZX Spectrum computer for my cousin. And then I didn't code for about 10, 15 years. So it's something nice to say, but uh, not really uh, much. Um, so I graduated in IT. Then I was a high school teacher. And I was also an occasional freelancer. And then I got uh, fed up with it, and I decided to change my life, and I moved on to, uh, to the Netherlands. Uh, currently, I'm a senior developer at uh, Werkspot, and I uh, enjoy riding my motorbike when there's a little bit of sun in the Netherlands. <coughs> okay, so what's this talk about? It's about uh, ideas from other people. So it's stuff that I've learned along the time, principles, and. Uh, tries the things that uh, try to guide me um, when I'm coding. Uh, and it's about how, in the end, I uh, uh, make a mental map of how those ideas fit together. And, uh, and that's what guides me when I'm uh, uh, coding. However, this is not about uh, silver bullets. It's not about the holy grail. Uh, like uh, uh, the previous speaker said, uh, um, Perfection is the enemy of good. So don't just grab all these ideas and drop it all together in a project, because that's not how it works. Uh, you need to understand the ideas, and then when the opportunity comes, pick the ideas that make sense in the project and make sense to your team, and then apply them. So let's start with uh, thinking about a bit of history. How did we evolve with uh, programming? So we, had, uh, we started in the 50s, around there, with the non-structured programming. So it's just some assembly code put together. And uh, then that code base, it started to grow. So we needed to uh, make it a bit uh, easier to handle. So we had uh, some uh, uh, conditionals, some loops. But then it was still uh, growing, and uh, uh, we decided to uh, make some uh, uh, blocks of code that we could reuse. So Then we came up with uh, functions and procedures. And then later on, we came up with uh, object-oriented programming, which is putting data and the uh, logic that manip manipulates that data together. And then in the 90s, uh, we couldn't really evolve the languages that much anymore. There wasn't uh, key uh, evolvement. So we started uh, thinking about a more uh, high-level, granular uh, thing to organize our code, and that's uh, design patterns. And if we think about this, this is all uh, about having a big chunk of code, so a big problem, and breaking it up in smaller pieces so that we can uh, manage it better. Remove some pieces, replace it uh, with some other pieces, reuse them, so on. And this is not a software development uh, uh, principle. This is an engineering principle. We find it everywhere. And parallel to this, we also evolved in a higher granularity level, a uh, more architectural level. And in, in the beginning, we, have the, we had the monolith. And then in the beginning of the 80s, we started uh, trying out with, uh, with distributed computing, and that was CORBA. And that didn't work very well, because it would uh, abstract the actual remote call. So people, when run the software, they didn't really know uh, if the call was going to be local or remote. So, So we moved on to a service-oriented architecture. We made explicit those remote calls. And then we had uh, services that needed to communicate, but they uh, had different uh, languages. They were not, they were not thought of uh, to, communicate between, to communicate between them. So we needed to put something in between to do, do some translation between services. So then they came up the enterprise service bus. That didn't work out well either, because that thing in the middle started to grow, and it would grow and grow, and uh, it would be a great place to put some business logic. And it happens that if it fails, everything else fails, because nothing else can communicate. So then it came up to microservice. And microservice has a nice principle, which is uh, uh, dumb pipes and uh, smart uh, endpoints, right? And nowadays, we're already talking about nanoservices. And this is also in the same direction as I mentioned before. If we have a big problem, and we break it up in smaller pieces so that it's more manageable. In the end, this is all about modularity and uh, encapsulation. 
modularity being the capability of uh, taking pieces out and uh, putting uh, other pieces in and disabling pieces, um, changing them, and encapsulation about uh, hiding the, the nitty-gritty details. Let's talk about the monolith now. So, uh, some years ago, when, when the microservices started to being the hype, uh, everyone was saying that uh, that was the solution for everything. So we had the monolith, and the monolith was always a big ball of mud, and with microservices, everything would be fine. Well, nowadays, we're talking something different. We're saying, like, yeah, well, actually, it adds a lot of complexity, and if we cannot make it uh, a nice code base with a monolith, then with a microservices architecture, yeah, we're not going to make it either. We need to find something else. We need to think about uh, a way to make code clean, both in a monolith and microservices. So when do we, when do we have actually a, a big ball of mud? There's uh, several reasons. Some of them I can uh, come up with. It's uh, class and method names are not uh, conveying meaning. So we look at the code, we look at the method name, and we don't know what it's going to do. So we need to dive into the code to actually understand it. There's no obvious place to put the code. I remember once I uh, started at a company and uh, did some piece of code and asked one of my colleagues, where should I put this code? Now, it's, I have it working, but uh, where does it, did it, does it should, should it live? And my colleague told me, well, yeah, just put it anywhere. It's working, so it's fine. Well, it's not. Because then when we want to find that code, it's going to be a mess. It's also when we have a dependency mess. We link everything together, and then in the end, we touch something on this side of the application. It breaks something on the other side of the application. You cannot really, you don't have a module because everything is connected to each other. And it's also when we have uh, something that is untestable and unrefactorable. Refactoring is uh, the ability to uh, uh, change your code, hopefully improving it, without changing the functionality, the behavior. So uh, the, test should be, the test that you have should be, be the same before and after refactoring. Um, but when we test, uh, we shouldn't test with the mindset of testing a method, and we shouldn't test with the mindset of testing a class. We should test with the mindset of testing uh, a module, the public API of a module. And the module can be a class, and that's fine, but it should be, the mindset should be about the module, because there's, there's classes that you don't really need to test. They're implementation details, just like the private methods inside of class, we don't test them, because they're an implementation detail. Same thing with modules. But then, if we don't have clear boundaries for the modules, how are we going to test the API of a module? So we need to have those boundaries very clear. So in the end, this means that we don't have uh, clear and enforced uh, design rules. People don't know, our colleagues don't know uh, the design rules of our application. So how do we solve the problem of a big ball of mud? Well, this is a big ball of mud. Imagine you have this at home. Um, you work with it. You need to take it to work. And then when you want a nut or a bolt, you need to go and search inside of this box. And it's uh, going to be difficult. It's going to take quite some time to find what you need. So this is a big ball of mud. But then how, how do we solve this? If you have this at home, how do we solve this? Well, we organize it. We put the similar uh, uh, bolts and nuts in one little box, and you group them up together, and then you put it in another box, and then you put it in a van, and you take it to work. And if you need to take uh, only a few of them, then it's fine to decide which little boxes to take and which not. Same thing can happen with code. Code, we also have granularity levels. So we have plain code, and then we have methods, and then we have classes, and then we have namespaces, which are folders. And then we have finally libraries. And I think <clears throat> we as a community, we're not so good still with, uh, with namespaces. And that's what I uh, want to talk about. So a bit more of history. In uh, the end of the 90s, Uncle Bob uh, published a series of uh, principles. Uh, he didn't come up with those principles himself. He read about them, learned them, and then published them in an uh, online magazine. And I want to bring out uh, three of them here that are relevant to the presentation. The first one is a single responsibility principle. He uh, 
defines it as a class should have only one reason to change. But I think a bit different. I think more in, as a code unit. Um, if we think about it, uh, a method should only have one reason to change it as well, should only have one responsibility, as well as a class, and as well as a module. If we think about an ORM, it has one responsibility. Sure, it does a lot of stuff in it, but in the end, it has one responsibility, which is mapping uh, objects to uh, a relational database. Then we have uh, the common closure principle and the common reuse principle, which basically means that we should uh, put together code that works together. So and this makes me think, for example, about Symfony. Symfony is my favorite framework, but it's not perfect. So if we think about the default structure of Symfony, we have the source folder, and then we have a folder for the controllers. And then next to the controllers, we have a folder for the resources, and inside we have a folder for the views. And then all that structure from the controllers needs to, uh, uh, we try to keep it in sync with the folder with all the views, so that we know what controllers work with what views. Well, what these principles uh, say is that we shouldn't do this. We should put, OK, we have a folder with a controller. Then let's put the views, the templates, next to that controller. Then you know exactly what's working with what. It's easy to find. So this is what these uh, this, um, principles um, say. So then in the, in the 90s, we had the three-tier architecture. Uh, dependencies go downwards. The top uh, layers know about the bottom layers. The bottom layers don't know about the top layers. Then in 2003, it came uh, Domain Driven Design by Eric Evans. He published the book. If you don't know about it, you should uh, buy it. still a great book. And um, Domain Driven Design is too big to, to, to talk about in one talk. But I'm going to talk about some things that I find uh, quite relevant. So it all starts with domain expert interaction. We developers need to be in contact with the business people and the users of our applications. Um, we get together, we talk about it, and we come up with uh, shared knowledge about what the application is and how it should work. Nowadays, it's very common to do it with uh, event storming sessions. Anyway, we come up with this um, uh, uh, shared knowledge. You build this ubiquitous language, <coughs> which is a language, uh, a set of terminology that uh, is to be used uh, both by business people and developers, so that we all can understand what we are talking about. And then we reflect that we use those same words, that same terminology, we use it in the code. And this is very important, because if we talk about uh, uh, um, consumer user in an application with your uh, uh, business people, but then you call it something else in the code, uh, especially for, for new developers that are not aware of those differences, it's going to be a mess. It's going to be uh, something that will, in the end, drive to bugs and problems. So we have this ubiquitous language that we use in the code and with the business people, and we also can have a context map. And a context map is just a sketch. It's a sketch that you can uh, draw in a whiteboard and uh, talk about it with the uh, business people, with your colleagues, developers. And uh, in domain driven design, that is this concept of, um, of bounded context. So you see here in this uh, sketch, you see a few bounded concepts, CRM, categories, products. Um, they reflect uh, subdomains. Um, and we have uh, the core domain in the middle, which is the most important domains. It's what actually uh, uh, makes your application different what make, makes the money come in. So those are uh, the three uh, uh, domains, the, the, the three bounded concepts that, that uh, matter the most. And then we have um, the shared canal in between, two of them. So the bounded concepts should be completely isolated from each other. They should know nothing about each other, except when you have a shared canal. When you have a shared canal, it's a piece of code that is shared between bounded contexts. For some reason, you need to share it, then you share it. And then you have also an anti-corruption layer, which is some kind of a layer that uh, translates between bounded contexts, so that there is no leakage between uh, code from one bounded context into another bounded context. Then we come to 2005, and uh, there's this uh, guy called Alistair Coburn, and he uh, publishes a blog post in his blog about uh, hexagonal architecture. 
Uh, later on, he changed the name to Ports and Adapters because it was reflecting more what he uh, wanted to express. And what he says is, okay, we have uh, an application, and this, this application core is what our application actually is about. And we have ports to that application, entry uh, uh, points and exit points. So we have, for example, in this uh, application, uh, uh, a use case, which is a port, create user. So if we, uh, basically, that's a service class with some uh, business logic, uh, a use case, and it will create a user. So it shouldn't matter where the request comes from. If we tell our application to create a user, we should always be able to reuse that piece of code. It doesn't matter if the request comes from HTTP or from a CLI command, from a website or from an API. So what we do, what he says that we should do is, OK, we have a delivery mechanism, uh, but in the end, the logic that we want to uh, execute is the same, so we create an adapter. And this adapter will, will adapt uh, uh, a delivery mechanism to, um, to a use case, to a port. So if we have an, a website, we have a controller to create a user, that controller is an adapter for the website to trigger the use case. If you have an API, we'll have another controller, and that will do the same. And the console command, the same. Um, so it receives a request, extracts data from the request, and triggers the use case. These are the driver adapters, as he called them, because they drive the application. On the other side, we have another port, an SMS port, which is used when the application wants to send out an SMS. In the most simple form, these, these ports on this side, they're basically a, an interface. They can be more complicated than that, but in the most simple form, it's an interface. So let's think about it that way. So the application knows about this interface, and that's all it knows about. And what we do then is create an adapter that will implement this interface and wrap around a third-party library. So the application core, it still only knows about the interface, and we inject the adapter wherever that interface is. If we need to, to change the, the SMS provider library, we just create another adapter, inject it instead of the first one, we're done. And these are named the driven adapters because they are driven by the application. So I hope you can uh, see this. Um, so this is an example, uh, uh, very simple, about a, a, a driver adapter. So you have a controller, so login controller. We have the constructor. In the constructor, we inject uh, the service that we're going to use. Then we have an action, login, receives a request, takes some data out, uh, data out of that request, and passes it in to, uh, to, the, to the server, to the service. On the other side, uh, we have a driven adapter. This is slightly different. Notice that it implements uh, an interface. That interface is the port. It belongs to the core. It uh, receives as uh, in injected the, the third-party library. So it wraps around that third-party library. Then it has a method that is used in the core. And it just uh, receives some data and adapts that data to the actual library needs. <clears throat> okay, so then it's uh, 2008, and uh, Jeffrey Palermo uh, published a blog post in his uh, blog about onion architecture. And he says, okay, uh, before, we were talking about what's outside of the application. Now we're talking about what's inside of the application. And inside of the application, he detected, see, he, he noticed three layers. The first one, the domain model. It's a reflection of the actual domain. So it has your entities, your, the value objects that your entities use, enums, so forth, so on. Um, then you have the domain services, which, are, which is the logic that is domain logic, but it doesn't quite fit in entities. Usually, it's about uh, coordinating entities. And then you have your application services, which are uh, entry and exit points of the application. They're the use cases. Usually, in, in, it, in a simple form, the use case uh, will use a repository to get an entity, tell the entity to do something, persist the entity, and we're done. It's noticeable here that we, the dependencies go inward. So remember when you have the, the layered architecture, it was dependencies would go downwards. Here, the dependencies go inwards. So in the previous uh, 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 architecture, then, then um, 
Yeah, the, the domain would know about the persistence layer, but here the domain is in the middle, and the persistence layer is in the out, outside of it. So in this case, the domain, the entities, they don't, don't know about the, the persistence mechanism at all. <coughs> then it's 2011, and Uncle Bob um, publishes uh, something again. He calls it uh, Screaming Architecture because he says, okay, we are organizing our code uh, not in an ideal way. We have a folder for all controllers, we have a folder for all entities, folder for all views, and this is not really, this is not really good. We should, uh, the, the application should, should scream out what it is about, he says. So we should uh, organize it differently. Let's make a component, a module, that is a, a, a domain-wise module, um, and call it a component, and uh, we have a healthcare component, and everything about healthcare is there. And if you think about it uh, with uh, domain-driven design, this is basically uh, what the, uh, the bounded contexts are, isolated, isolated pieces of, uh, of uh, uh, domain logic. <clears throat> okay, then uh, there's Greg Young. I think around 2006, he started to become more and more famous because he was talking about uh, CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. And how does this work? Well, we have uh, the controllers. Uh, as we saw in the example before, they call a service, a service and uh, trigger the service. Well, in this case, uh, it doesn't work that way. The controller will create a DTO, it's called a command. Uh, it represents some action in uh, our application. It uh, ships that command, sends it to a command bus. In the command bus, the command goes through several steps. So for example here, it validates the data that is inside the command. Then it opens the database transaction. Then it handles the, the command. Handling the command, in this case, is delivering the, that set of data into a service. So the service runs, uh, runs the use case. Uh, domain logic is uh, run as well. Persistence is done. Then in the end, goes back to the control goes back to command bus, closes the transaction, and uh, finally everything is uh, persisted. But this is much more or less what's uh, happening as well when we just have a service and we trigger the service. However, the difference is that we can uh, actually queue these commands, these actions. So we can just serialize it, put it in a queue, and then we can have uh, several workers, uh, uh, servers, that, uh, applications that just pull one command at a time from the queue and execute them. This is a way of parallelizing uh, um, the workload. On the other hand, uh, we also have a, a read model. So uh, the idea here is to separate the write model from the read model. And the read model is everything is much simpler because, well, you don't need to uh, iterate entities. If you just want to read data, you're not going to execute anything. And the business logic is in the entities, so to execute business logic, we need the entities. But in this case, when you, you just want to read data, you don't need to execute business logic. So it's simpler. To be honest, I never actually use the query bus. Uh, I just use query objects, and that's it. Simple. But anyway, the most important part is the, um, the write model, because it can have this, uh, this performance uh, boost of parallelizing execution. So. Um, Let's review this. So we have uh, the user interface, the application core, and the infrastructure. On the left side, we have the users happily sending commands, uh, actions, asking our application to do stuff. And in the other side, we have uh, the tools that our application is uh, using. So in the first layer, you have uh, our uh, driving adapters. They're basically the controllers for APIs for our website or the console commands. On the other side, you have the uh, driven adapters that will implement uh, your port and wrap around your third-party uh, library uh, tool. <clears throat> in this case also, the dependencies always go inward. So the outer layers know about the inner layers. The inner layers don't know about the outer layers. And the first layer is then the application layer. This is where the use cases are, so our application services. And also on this side, we'll have the command and the query bus. That's uh, the command handlers in the end are where our use cases are. On the other side, you'll have the event bus. 
which works pretty similar to a command bus, but of course the event, uh, while the command is delivered to only one uh, handler, then an event is, can be delivered to several handlers. Then we have the domain services in the, the domain layer in the middle, and then uh, finally we slice it. We slice those layers in, uh, in, uh, in like, the, uh, like Uncle Bob mentioned, those vertical slices. And it's important to notice that these command, this com this components, they should, uh, like the bounded constant, they should be independent. They should be decoupled from each other. And the way to decouple them is to use events. That's why I put the event buzz there. And it's very important. But this, is, this isn't all. So we have more layers. <clears throat> so we have all those layers that I uh, mentioned before. And then we have also the shared kernel, which is the code, if you remember from DDD, the code that is shared between bounded contexts, in this case, between components. So all the components are going to depend on that shared kernel or some of the components. So it's below. Then in the bottom, you have the programming languages and their native extensions, of course. We have to depend on that. And in between, I, uh, I've put a layer of what I call user land uh, extensions. They're not native extensions, but they're code that we build ourselves and we use as if, they, if it was actual uh, um, part of the programming language. So think about it, for example, with uh, PHP. It has the daytime object, and it's fine when you use it everywhere. In our code base, it's part of the language, so we can use it. Except if we, for some reason, need to add a method to it, then we cannot do that, right? So what we do, we create a new object, maybe even extending the daytime object from PHP. And we add that method there. But then, well, it's our own code. But there is no real reason to actually uh, uh, treat it in any way differently than we were treating the native daytime object, right? So that's uh, stuff that I would put in this layer. Same thing with the UUIDs. PHP doesn't provide UUIDs, but it could. It doesn't. But it's something very agnostic. Very, yeah, it, it has no relation to any kind of domain. It's very basic, low level. So it's also something we could put in that layer, treat it as um, part of the programming language. <clears throat> OK, so we have all these rules, all these ideas, and, uh, but then now, how do we actually put this in practice? How do we make this uh, visible in our code base? Um, there's uh, two tips, one from George Fairbanks and another from Simon Brown and Uncle Bob as well. So, one idea is to uh, drop hints in the code base, so in mainly in naming. So what he says is that we should name um, variables and classes and methods, try to name it in a way that represents something in the domain and uh, also represents something in, in, uh, technically in the architecture, the, the technical uh, role of that piece of code. This means, for example, with services, we have a, a, a service that uh, creates a user and it's a user service. So it handles users, it's about users, and it's, about, and it's a service. Same thing for repositories. If it's a repository that uh, is about users, then use a repository. And then you know exactly what type of code you have there, and you know how to uh, handle it, and what it should do, what it shouldn't do, and so on. Of course, don't do it with everything. There's a middle uh, term for everything. Huh? So don't do this all over your code base, because it's going to be, it's many times, just redundant. For example, for entities, you know, I don't see a need to post-fix everything with entity. Then the other idea is, uh, well, basically what Uncle Bob said, that we should clearly identify the components at a higher level. So how do we do this? Uh, well, we saw we have a user interface, infrastructure, application core. OK, so we have a folder for our source code. We can create these three folders inside, user interface, core, and infrastructure. On the user interface side, we then have APIs. So we create a folder for our APIs. We then have several APIs, one folder for each API. We have our console commands, create a folder for the console commands. We have our website. Maybe we have several websites, one for administration of the, web, of the, of the application, another one for our actual consumers of the application. So we can have a, a whole structure built like this. On the infrastructure side, is even simpler. So you have uh, different tools. You have a command bus. Then inside that command bus, that, that folder for the command bus, we can have 
uh, a folder for each implementation of a command bus. Maybe the, for the command bus, it doesn't make much sense. Uh, but yeah, if at some point you want to slowly replace one for another one, then you're going to need two folders there. And think about, for example, uh, an SMS provider. If you, you yeah, uh, at some point maybe you want to use, uh, uh, you want to expand your, uh, your product to you be used in several countries and you use different uh, uh, SMS providers in each country, then you're going to need several folders, for one for each vendor. Then we come to the core. Here it's a bit more complicated. So the idea is that we first create a folder for our components. So one folder for our components, then one folder for each uh, component, in this case, for example, a blog. Then inside it, one folder for our application layer with whatever we need inside. And then inside, uh, uh, next to the application layer, we create another folder for the domain stuff, our entities, and so on. And then outside of the components uh, folder, because it's not part to, of any component, we create a folder for our ports, our interfaces that uh, uh, we are going to use in the, in the core. And next to it, we create a folder for the shared kernel. <coughs> and in the shared kernel, of course, also outside of the component, because it doesn't belong to one single component, it's used by several components. So this is one way of organizing our code base. So recap, we have the first layer with the user interface, the core, the components, the ports, the infrastructure. Then we have our shared kernel there, because it's part of the core, but doesn't belong in any component. And then outside of all of that, we have our uh, language extension. And this is uh, something that is uh, quite agnostic of our uh, application, so we can even package it in a separate uh, repository, and you can reuse it in several projects. However, so we are going to organize it this way, but uh, we're only humans, so we're going to make mistakes. Uh, not everyone is uh, on, in sync with us. So how do we make sure that we don't, that our colleagues or us don't make mistakes? Well, same way we do with the rest of the code in the end. We do tests for it, right? We have a PHP unit running on a CI, and uh, so that's something we can do as well. So there's this little tool called uh, DepTrack. It's uh, created by Sensio Labs, and basically it's a command line tool. Create a YAML file where you configure it, configure the layers that you have, configure the relationships between the layers, what layers depend on what layers, and so on. And then you run it, and you get something like this. Now, if you think about it, this is pretty similar to what PHP unit does. So the same way you, you, you can run PHP unit in a CI, you can run this one in the CI, and just check that uh, the dependencies are what they should be. Of course, this is not uh, uh, the best view, um, but they can, uh, we can install some uh, plugin, and then we can get something like this. And here we say, OK, we can see clearly, OK, there's a controller, depending on the repositories, the queries, so on. And then there's a, there's a problem there on the other image. So there's a repository depending on the controller. Obviously, it shouldn't happen, so you have an error there. So you put this in your CI build. If it fails, it fails the build, and uh, it doesn't go to production. You need to fix it. So if you fell asleep during uh, my presentation, <laughs> uh, this is the last slide that you need to be awake. Um, so takeaways. Um, a code unit should uh, have only one logic place to live. And by this, I don't mean that we should magically know where a piece of code should, uh, should be. I mean that we open the source folder, and you're searching for a controller about a user. Uh, then you open the source folder, you know, OK, next folder is about the user interface, then the controller must be there. It's the only option. Then you dive into that one, and you see, OK, I have uh, um, uh, APIs, and you have a website. This is about a website controller. OK, then it uh, must be there, and so on, so on, and, uh, until you find it. Make the architecture explicit. And by this, I don't mean that you uh, do exactly what I, I, I mentioned here. Um, what I mean with this is that uh, make it so that uh, uh, the do, do choices to organize your code base and to make sure it keeps organized, it stays organized. But those choices should match what your project needs. And it should match what your team can handle. <coughs> 
So it depends on the project, it depends on, on the team that you have at hand, but find a way to organize it and to be consistent so that people can actually uh, uh, reason about it. Whatever uh, um, organization you uh, uh, find, you decide to do, you should always uh, favor modularity and encapsulation. That's, in the end, uh, the principle that uh, is driving uh, software development and, and engineering in general for, uh, for many decades. Build monoliths and plan microservices. I think of um, microservices uh, a lot, and um, not as to build microservices, but I think, okay, I have this monolith, and I want things to be decoupled. Uh, how would I do this in microservice architecture? How, how would I keep the, this code separated? And then I try to apply it uh, uh, with the obvious differences. I try to apply it in monoliths. This helps me a lot to uh, 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 think and forces me to think about how to uh, properly isolate pieces of code. And finally, enforce the architecture. We're only humans, we're going to make mistakes. So we need to have uh, checks and balances to uh, prevent us and our colleagues uh, to, from making mistakes. So yeah, this is it. Uh, there's a link for my uh, joined in uh, talk, so please uh, rate it so I can improve whatever needs to be improved. There's also uh, my slides um, and a cold sample in PHP and more information about this, uh, all these uh, ideas that I have. Thank you. It seems like we have a lot of questions for you. Let's Lord. see. Yeah. Jesus. Woo! Fire at will. Um, yeah, well, I would say, so the, the first question is, it seems to me that domain-driven design results in much more code than when we follow the framework rules. When should it be, be useful? Yeah, well, um, I think most frameworks, the default way of uh, doing things with the framework is about uh, uh, rapid application development. So if you have small applications, it doesn't, if, if it's an application that is supposed to live for three months for some event that's going to happen, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. Just do it fast, get it done, move on to the next project. Um, so if, but if you have a big application that's going to suppose, it's, it's supposed to last uh, for many, many years, and the domain is complex, then, then I think it's worth it to ap apply domain-driven design, to really understand what the application should be doing, talk with people around you, uh, and reflect uh, the domain in the, in the code. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Uh, so at the top, uh, next one. What's your, what's your opinion on returning values from the command handler? Yes, no, maybe. Examples would be appreciated. Um, yeah, I know. I don't. I don't really. Um, in the exa in my experience, what I've been doing is I don't return anything from the command handler, because uh, imagine. I mean, if you're expecting the command handler to return something, but then it's a cute command. Well, what are you? To where are you going to return it? It's. It's. Uh, so you might as well make it consistent and never return anything. If you need to get some data, then use a query object and uh, and get some data. But again, I mean, if you're uh, Triggering a command to uh, uh, do some action, uh, yeah, why should you return some uh, 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 meaningful data from the domain? I mean, um, okay, some cases might be useful, but yeah, again, you can use a query after triggering the command. Um, real world code examples out there. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot give you the code from my company. Uh, maybe it's even good that I don't do that. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, we try to apply this at, at the company where I work. We try to apply these principles. We don't apply them 100% because, again, there is no one boot fits all. So we think about the pros and cons, trade-offs, what makes sense to use where. Um, but I do have a little... Uh, um, pet project that I uh, showed in my slide, my last slide, and you can check it. And there I tried to isolate everything just to uh, even see if it was even possible to do such a thing. 
So I, also, I, I picked the, what I did there was pick up the, the Symfony demo project about the blog, and I just uh, uh, refactored the whole thing to be completely isolated. And it was a lot of work. But uh, it's not perfect, but it, it's an example. Um, there is no perfect application architecture, but if you have to pull only one PHP framework up that you see as a good example to follow, what would you be? Yeah. I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. I like Symfony a lot, so um, uh, I think uh, Laravel is also pretty good. At least it has a big, uh, a big community. Uh, it has its usefulness, so I think I don't have much experience with Laravel, but what people say is that yeah, Laravel is good for uh, smaller projects, but then when it come, becomes too big, it, there's problem and problems that come, come up. But I don't have my personal experience with it, so I can't, can't, can't say much. But I do like uh, Symfony a lot. Omitting the suffix seems quite popular these days. Let's say you have a user, user proxy, and a user interface. How would you name the interface here? Um, yeah, I would name it a user interface. <laughs> um, that, that's it. I, mean, I, I know there's a lot of people that don't like to do this, uh, and I understand the reasons why. But maybe just because I'm used to it, um, the reasons why people, uh, for interface especially, they uh, remove the interface is because it shouldn't matter. In the end, it's a user, and it shouldn't matter whatever what goes inside that uh, interface uh, uh, injected in, the, in, in that place. But for me, it's just I'm used to it, maybe. I don't know. I, don't, I also don't think there is much uh, difference, there is much uh, harm done either way. Do you think it makes sense to separate infrastructure parts uh, of the app into modules as well? Um, yes, I think, I think maybe not. Uh, again, you need to check the, the trade-offs. I like to do it as a principle, um, but you need always to check the trade-offs. Is it worth actually to uh, create a port and adapter and abstract everything or not? For example, for a, 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 an SMS provider, I, th I would say yes, because it's very simple to do. Uh, for Doctrine, for the ORM, for example, it's uh, a lot more complex. And the chances that you will actually ever change the ORM are very low, even if you change from Doctrine 2 to Doctrine 3 in the future, and it might be complex, but it's uh, quite far away. So check the, 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 the trade-offs always. Um, how to practice DDD in legacy apps? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, DDD starts with, uh, with talking, right? Talking with uh, business people and talking with uh, the users of your application. So it starts there. That's the beginning. And sometimes even that beginning in, in companies is very difficult to achieve because uh, business people are not used to that. Business people are used to, yeah, I know what's best, so let's do this. And um, uh, so in many companies, what I hear from uh, people that I know, it's, it's very difficult to even change that mentality. But that's, uh, that's a good place to start, and then try to reflect it in the code. Uh, how to solve need that one command call, other one, more commands? Um, I try not to, not to do that. Um, I always try, it because you want to do something. Once it's done, it's done. It's one thing you need to do. However, of course, uh, there are side effects. Uh, so when you trigger a command, you're doing a use case. At the end of the use case, you trigger a, a, an event. And then uh, from that event, you actually trigger other logic that you need to trigger. You don't send another command. So that's how you do it do it. Um, how would you implement communication between PCs if it needs to be synchronous? Uh, BCs? Uh, what's BCs? Oh, bottom context. Mm, yeah, it shouldn't be synchronous, period. <laughs> I don't know. Um, usually it doesn't need to be synchronous. <laughs> 
Uh, I think I never really found yeah, it's not, uh, it's not usual. I, I cannot remember, recall from the top of my head a uh, situation where it actually had to, uh, had to be synchronous. If you find a, a, a situation like that, maybe what that means is that our boundaries are not correct. Maybe you need to think about where the boundaries should, should be. Maybe it should be one unique uh, bounded context. How to decide if something should be a component or, uh, or a domain? Um, well, uh, uh, um, a component uh, has a domain layer and uh, an application layer. So this question doesn't quite, uh, I don't quite understand it. But um, yeah, the, a component is, 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 is in the end a piece of the application. It has a piece of domain inside. Have you ever seen worked with uh, Magento 2? And if so, what's your opinion on its code architecture? Never, never did it. I, I, yeah, I had some com contact with it uh, years ago, but but I quickly ran away. <laughs> um, do you think it makes sense to separate the infrastructure parts of the app into module? Yeah, I already answered that one. Uh, yeah, in the last slide of my um, uh, presentation, you have a link to these slides. Actually to a bigger version of the slides because I have to shorten it up for this talk. Uh, so you can get it there from SlideShare. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> Um, how do you approach refactoring legacy apps with over... Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, one piece at a time, one line at a time. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, what do you think about CMS Jomo? Yeah, I worked with it uh, many, many years ago. I did some um, uh, 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 modules for it. I think 15 years ago, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, there's better things out there. But it's a, it's a CMS. I mean, uh, CMSs are usually slow. Uh, it has its usefulness, just like WordPress and, uh, and whatever. But it's uh, in generally, if you want performance, then that's not the way to go. Do you prefer having user manager or having logic splitted like user registration manager, user login manager? Um, I would skip the manager part. I would have it as user registration uh, service uh, and user login service. But well, again, it's the same. Um, yeah, I would try to split it. It depends on uh, on how much, how big it is. If it's uh, two or three methods, then you can. I, I would say keep it in the in the one class. If it gets too big, then then start to break it up. Is this still? Can we, are we? We have some more time. You have like yeah. eight, nine more minutes, so. Okay, okay. <laughs> or lunch, okay. or lunch. <laughs> How do you implement task when part of task should be separated to microservice? For example, report generation. Uh, well, if, if it should be separated to microservice, then I guess I would separate it to a microservice. Um, for example, uh, I can think about uh, uh, invoices, um, generating invoices, a PDF, then that's something that can be outside in a web service in your uh, cluster and then just uh, ship it there. No, nothing with video, Virtual Mart. No. Yeah. I think it's done, right? Okay, yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> Woo!